You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. What's going on, footwear world? You need like a megaphone, my friend. My mouth is a megaphone. It is a megaphone. As my mother would say. Is that what she said to you? Well, she usually she just stick a stick a bar of soap in my mouth. So how many times have you had that happen over your life? Mm, probably half a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> and how many times did I need it? A hundred times, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're an adult, right? I'm so self-aware. You're self-aware. It's good to be self-aware. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, we try. We do try. We, we try. do try. Speaking of someone who tries, so um, we have a dear friend, and I throw that around a lot, but he is a dear friend. Um, his name is Frank Lavin, Andy. You and I have known him for a long time. He used to be one of my bosses at the Commerce Department. He was Undersecretary of Trade. I love him. Trade. I love Master Lavin. Sing- you love La- you love you some Lavin. Yep. Yep. He was Undersecretary. No, he was Ambassador to Singapore. Now he start. Long time ago, actually, it's been a decade. He started this thing called Export Now, and he helps yep. American brands break into the e-commerce world in China. Is that an exclamation line? Like Export Now? I think it is. Export Now. It depends export on what, Now. Depends on what mood you're in, right? It's a, what mood Frank Lavin is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the privilege of talking to Frank. Um, we did a con- we had a conversation. It was morning his time in Singapore, evening my time in D.C. And we're going to do a lot of talking about the China e-commerce market. And, uh, and so I think, I think this is just something people need to know. If they want to grow their business, they want to be active, they want to be ensuring their brands are purchased by consumers worldwide, particularly in a marketplace where consumers are, are growing and, mm-hmm. and taking on more disposable income, they need to understand how to do that. And Frank is a great tour guide along the way. And so we're going to roll the tape now. And, uh, and so enjoy my conversation with Frank Lavin. So this conversation is with Frank Lavin. Frank Lavin is the founder and CEO of Export Now. He has been ambassador to Singapore. He has been the undersecretary of international trade in the U.S. government. He had worked in the Reagan White House. I think he's had just about every job known to man within the political system here in the U.S. Uh, And based in Singapore now, Frank, it's so great to have you on the Shoe and Show. We're very excited to be talking with you. You're an old friend. Uh, a former boss and still an old friend, which doesn't happen that often. And um, and I appreciate you coming on the program today. Matt, it's uh, delighted to connect with you here. And uh, we always uh, get excited when we talk about China. We talk about U.S. brands going to China. And it's good just to reconnect with you and hear what's going on at your end as well. Yeah, so let's get right to it. You know, ta- you left the U.S. government. You started this thing called Export Now. Um a number of years ago, because you had this vision about the need to get into the China market and not everyone has a, a huge staff and has multilingual, you know, folks that can help them um, navigate the kind of the environment that is China. Walk me through what that looks like and why you started Export Now and the services that you provide. Yeah, in fact, I'll, I'll take your point and, and, and just build on that, that most companies, even reasonably large U.S. companies, uh, do not have an international department or don't have a strategic planning department. What they have is what you'd expect. They have operations, they have finance, they have marketing, they have uh, distribution, they have sort of the, the normal functional element because they've been building this brand and building this successful company over decades, but, but they're just now the cusp of some level of maturity in the U.S. or their home market, and they're starting to look around. So what we thought of in China is, look, there's a lot of hunger in China for international brands. And you look at brands like Nike or Levi's or Disney, extremely well in the China market. But these folks typically do have a strategic planning department or an international department or a China team that uh, a mid-tier U.S. brand can't. So you bridge that gap through e-commerce, because if you set up an e-commerce operation in China, you don't need a huge footprint. You don't need a team. You're just running a e-commerce store in China for the Chinese consumer, uh, but you don't need multiple stores. You don't need uh, sophisticated logistics and very simple finance as well. So it just gives you a window to sell into the market uh, without, without having to build an elaborate structure in that country. 
So let's just take a case study. You know, you have a lot of great clients, uh, both in fashion, apparel, footwear, and then outside as well. And and what are like three things you really guide your clients on when they're thinking about breaking into the Chinese market? Because the numbers are like blow your mind. 1.3, 1.4 billion people rising class, et cetera, et cetera. What are kind of the things that you really coach your clients on as it relates to internet? Well, the yeah. Well, there's two or three, look, we, we, there's a few things we look at with a new client or new brand because you only want to go down this path if there's a reasonable prospect of success. You don't want to, you know, it's a fair amount of work on both sides to say we've set up the, the inventory, we've got the Chinese website, we've got currency approved, you know, we've done all this work, let's go. Uh, so one thing we'd look at, for example, to see kind of a brand making in China is, well, how well do they do on e-commerce in their home market? Do they have the internal capabilities that they, they can be active in digital communication? They can talk to consumers digitally. They're on the main digital. They're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and so forth in the U.S. And they put out content and have followers. So there's something about the brand. There's something about the communications that really works in the digital space. Uh, and if a brand can't do that, if a brand says we've never done that, we'll do that, it's very hard to start doing it in a new market. So one thing we say in our little company is if there's magic in your brand, we can make that magic work in China. But if there's no magic in your brand anyhow, it's very hard to say, please make it magical in China. So, so, so we would say rule number one is the company has to have some kind of digital capabilities and e-commerce success in its home market as an indicator that, yeah, we can now adapt that and make that work in China. Because what we're really talking about, if you look at the Nike store in China, the Nike store in the U.S., you're really saying all we're doing is adapting and localizing a very successful brand image from a home market. We're going to make it work in this new market. What about, I like that term localizing, but you have this famous kind of, or maybe infamous example of peanut butter, right? It may be magical in the U.S. because every every kid on the, in in the U S is eating a peanut butter jelly sandwich right now, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, magic doesn't always translate. So how do you make that jump from being magical and making it magical in China? Well, there can, and you're right. There can be cultural gaps and other kind of gaps. And and peanut butter had several challenges. One is it's not part of the Chinese diet. So people don't understand how it's used or when it's used. And they don't, is it, is it a health food? Is it a convenience food? Is it just, good value for money. And we would say in America, well, it's all of those uh, attributes, but we grew up with it. We're familiar with it. Even sandwiches aren't part of the Chinese diet. So you really have to uh, educate. You have to engage in a conversation. The, the guys who did this extremely successfully, not with peanut butter, but with coffee is Starbucks because they face the same set of problems. Coffee's not native to China. Nobody grew up drinking coffee. A coffee shop is something nobody's been to in their life. So, so it's a bit of a journey for the brand to have that conversation, say coffee's not a bad way to start the day and a coffee shop's not a bad place to meet friends. And they've sort of won over the country in a, you know, it's a multi-year journey, but you have to be able to have that conversation. Now, the good news is with footwear and apparel, first of all, it's, it's highly intuitive what you're offering and it's very visual what you're offering so the chinese consumer can warm to it readily but if you're a new brand so they understand athletic shoes performance shoes outdoor shoes fashion accessories they, that, that's 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 i think well baked into chinese consumer behavior at this point so really what we're talking about with footwear is your particular brand or style can you crack into an established market and can you allow the chinese consumer to fall in love with your product. And some brands are really good with this and some brands struggle with it. Now the platforms are of interest to us because we all know the platforms here in the U S Amazon, eBay, uh, you know, there's, there's some friction developing, particularly with third party sellers on, on platforms like Amazon with our brands. And that's something that kind of continues to hang out there. And, um, and so when you come to someone and say, Hey, I've got this e-commerce platform in China and they're, they're going to think of Alibaba or they're going to think of knockoffs. Right. Uh, what are the platforms? What are the assurances that are out there? And which brands have said, you know what, we got to be in China. And even though that may be a concern they're they've jumped in feet first. Yeah. 
Yeah, by the way, everything you just articulated are all sort of valid discussion points, and every company's got a slightly different philosophy or approach to channel competition, or everybody, you know, has different sensitivities. So we try to come up with a solution that we say, this, this is what we would normally recommend, but we understand your preferences might be slightly different. Some, some companies are, are quite open to gray market, based, meaning informal sales channels. They say anything that moves the numbers up, we don't care. And that fellow's doing work for us. And if that fellow's buying and reselling product, that's okay. And even, even really established brands like Nike, you'll see at the end of the bell curve, Nike will have some SKUs that they don't bring to a particular market. And so there's space for an informal seller to take some special product or limited edition run and resell them in that market, right? Even uh, so, so even the, the very successful brands will allow for some minor participation of resellers or informal channels. Um, <clears throat> what we would say uh, in the first instance, though, is that over 90% of e-commerce activity in China takes place on a platform. The biggest ones being the Alibaba platforms, Tmall is the, the one you'll hear about a lot. That's the largest in the country. And the secondary platform outside of the Alibaba system is JD or Jingdong, JD.com. So, uh, but Alibaba, Tmall's got some 60% of the market. JD's got about 20% of the market. So, so you've got reasonably good market coverage just on Tmall and you've got really good coverage if you put Tmall and JD together. So that's not a bad place to start. And when you get beyond that, they tend to be specialty platforms or verticals, which can be helpful as a secondary strategy because there's flash sales, there's group sales, there could be verticals in the fashion industry and apparel and so forth where shoes can do well. But we'd really say those are those are what you do after you've got your main stores functioning well. After you've got Tmall going and maybe JD going, then look at other opportunities to move product. But that's normally not where you start. And the great thing about Tmall as a starting point is Tmall uh, only allows the brand owner or authorized agent to sell the product. Meaning if you or I show up at Tmall tomorrow with a truckload of Nike shoes and say, I want to sell them, they would, they, you and I cannot open a Nike store. Only if Nike gives us a letter that says we're the authorized China distributor for Nike, right? So the point is the official, the official branded store you will have on Tmall will be uh, just like your dot-com store in the U.S., that you're the only person that can run that store. And if I may offer just a little thought to people listening to this podcast, of course. You, you can search on Tmall in English or Chinese, meaning go to tmall.com, T-M-A-L-L, -L, no hyphen, or you just Tmall, five letters, dot com, and you can search for Nike or Adidas or Reebok or L.L. Bean or anything you want and click, you can click around a bit. It is in Chinese, but you click around a bit and you'll see the Nike store, nike.tmall.com. It'll, it'll show you it's a Nike store. It has the same look, the same feel as the Nike U.S. store. Obviously, by design, the Chinese consumer is going to have the same instinct, the same response in Mr. Brand position as the American consumer does. So what do they want? They want high-performance athletic shoes. It's also a lifestyle product. They want to be able to tell their friend and show their friend they just got a new pair of Nikes, the same way American consumers want to make that statement as well. So uh, so they've done, I think, a very nice job of localizing and adapting. What's going to be different? Well, uh, the physique can be different. Shoe sizes can be different in one country to another. And then, of course, things like sports preferences can be different, that one sport will be a, a little more popular in a country than another sport. So, so your product mix is going to be different. Your size will be different. Color preferences and so forth can be different as well. But you say, but fundamentally, it is the same store. It is the same store selling the same great products. Now, you talked about the Chinese consumer and the desire to have legitimate products, kind of what I inferred from your comments. And that raises the question and something that we've talked about before, but the need to have uh, some kind of avenue for consumer engagement in China because consumers in China are much more apt to call up a brand or a company or et cetera before they make a purchase. Talk to us about that dynamic, which is quite different than here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I would say in general, the Chinese consumer wants to have a conversation and the American consumer on e-commerce is on e-commerce because we don't want to have a conversation. Exactly. I go on Amazon to buy a book 
because it's just easier and faster. I know the book and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not interested in talking to somebody about it. And if I want to learn more about the book, I can go to find a review of the book or I can go to Goodreads as places I can actually understand the book a bit better. But again, I'm not interested in, in, in discussing this book. Uh, but the Chinese consumer ha- it, it is a little more digital, a little more plugged in. And in our view, some of this is a validation device, meaning they're trying to validate the, what you're saying, what you're what you're saying in your communications and on your website, they want it validated by somebody. So we we see dramatically that most purchases in China have what's called a front end communication. Most purchases in China have a question at or before the time of purpose purchase, meaning most most transactions in the U.S. do not have a front end communication. You will go on Amazon and buy a book and not have any any question or answer any conversation with anybody and you're happy just to get the book two days later uh so so customer contact crm setup in china has to have a very rapid response time you have to man that and stipulated hours put that on there and you will typically get a consumer before that purchase is made ask a question even if they're just asking a question which is clearly posted on the website so if your website says if you order by noon today it will be shipped the same day you will you will frequently get a question that says by the way if i order by noon today will it ship the same day and and uh, so the point is he's not the person's not asking that for information and it's no there's no need to clarify it's a pretty straightforward thing. but they're just saying i want to make sure that somebody's answering this inquiry and somebody's responding and this is a professional company that is set up the right way and if you can't answer the phone so to speak you're not going to ship my order so it's a very important validation point so that digital presence in china and the crm the contact information of china is very important to successful marketing one point we would make psychologically in china is that the consumer in china is not just making a purchase the consumer in china is joining a club they're joining the Nike club. Nike is now part of their identity. They are proud to own Nikes. They tell their friends about owning Nikes. They're wearing and showing their new Nikes. So you have to make the consumer happy that the consumer is joining your club. And we'll talk about it with their friends. We'll show photos of it with their friends. We'll have this conversation with you. After they buy a pair of shoes from you, they'll say, guess what? My boyfriend or my husband took me out and we went to this and here's a photo of me. And what do you think? And you, you want to be able to respond to that so because they're, they're now part of your club. Now, what's that? I've heard the – what's the rate? Like 90-something percent of purchases on e-commerce have some it kind is, of interaction? It is, over, it is over 90%. You're absolutely right. Over 90% of purchases in China e-commerce have front-end contact. So you, you, better, you better have a contact team there that can answer and respond to the phone. Whereas in, in the U.S., it is single digit. In the yeah. U.S., they, you typically – look, I'm going – I'm on Amazon Prime and I need some toothpaste. I mean, there's really not much of a conversation there, is there? I just, wow. just ship it to me, please, and and uh, the toothpaste will be there tomorrow. So, so we are just on the tail end of uh, Prime Day here, which is this this consumer holiday. It was created by Amazon, and that leads me to wonder: Can you explain what the heck Singles Day is? Because we see the headlines, but some some of our listeners may have no idea what Singles Day is and how important. Well, it is. And by the way, Prime Day you can you can look in the literature, and this Prime Day is derived from Singles Day. So Singles Day was the the original holiday, so to speak, the original e-commerce holiday, which was not started by Alibaba, but certainly popularized and made famous by Alibaba. And then it's a national day. There's a national television gala that goes on for four hours the night of <laughs> Singles Day. Singles Day is 11-11, which is four ones, one 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 one. And the idea is, so Singles Day, right? So let's follow Singles And the idea is something like this, Matt. You have much smaller families in China than the U.S. They had a single child policy for a long time. So Kids grow up without siblings, and think about it. Now we're in the second generation. They don't have aunts or uncles. They don't have cousins, and so the point of but you have a fair amount of prosperity. The country's had a very strong economic growth now over several decades, so it's reaching middle income status. And there's certainly a significant percentage of the country which is affluent, and and in the modern consumer sector, and that's who we're talking to through e-commerce. But the point is, what we're really trying to say through Singles Day is we're signaling to all these people. You don't need to wait 
for a holiday to get something nice for yourself. And you don't need to wait for a gift. You might not get a gift if you don't have any siblings. Your birthday might be less significant for gift giving or for consumer acquisitions than it might be in the United States. So why don't you just buy something for yourself? And we, Alibaba, will set up a holiday for Singles Day that you can just buy something for yourself. And what we'll do is we'll require, they require participating brands to offer best prices if they want to participate in the promotion. So it's a really good deal for the consumer. You're getting marked down product and it's a really high volume sales day. So you get a lot of a lot of volume. In fact, I was looking at the data from last year's single day, last November, and whatever was 30 billion US in a day. But that one day, that one day of e commerce, if that were a country, it would be something like the 12th largest <laughs> e commerce market in the world. It was something like, like uh, bigger than Korea, but smaller than Brazil, or something between Brazil and Korea, and get it mixed up. But to say just that $30 billion in one day is a huge amount of volume to run through anybody's e commerce system in 24 hours. So it was a, quite a successful product. Well, then it becomes sort of self fulfilling, right? When you tell the, the merchants, give me discounts or put you into promotions, when you run a national television show, then it's a gala with, you know, singing and dancing and promotional material things. So it's a gala kind of Hollywood production. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can't, I can't remember this fellow's name, but they hired this Ameri They hired a Hollywood producer, but the guy, they hired the guy who does the Super Bowl halftime shows, right? Right. So they hired, because that's what it is. It's just a big whoop de doo fireworks and cheerleaders and, you know, stuff going on and some magic shows and, a little vaudeville and you know, and it's, I've, I've, I've been to, I've been in the live audience, right? It's a fun event and it just, well, you know, why not? Why not? You yeah, got to exactly. watch it and you got to do something and it's, it's a TV show. So, you know, let's, let's see what's on tonight. And it's a big look, it'll, it'll have, you know, 200 million viewers for this thing, which Great. is sort of the, that whole middle class of China or upper middle class is sort of tuned into it. And indeed, if you ever said, look, I need a new big screen TV. You'd say, well, let me wait till singles day. and It'll be marked down. I'll get a, I'll get a good deal on it. Or if you say I need, you know, we should get a new pair of shoes. Now I've got a new job or I'm trying to do something and I've got a little money and I'm looking for shoes. Let's, let's get this on singles day. So all the numbers really spike and it, it just helps everybody it helps the merchants helps the consumers. All right. So two more, two last topics. Um, first, there's a lot of logistical trickiness to, you know, if you're an American brand and you produce in China or you produce in Vietnam, but you want to sell into China and then on e-commerce, do you guys help with kind of the logistics part of all that? Because that can be somewhat tricky. Um, yeah, we absolutely. We do. We'll, we'll provide a logistics solution. I'll tell you, there's some really good news in this, in that Shanghai is the largest port in the world. Right. So, so what we would normally say to any U.S. brand, uh, if you can get your product to Port of Los Angeles or any of the West Coast ports, we'll work out a China solution. So if you currently right now distribute to a dozen different distributor or warehouse outlets in the U.S., that's a dozen distribution. Just make just this will just be number 13. Right. The Port of Los Angeles. But typically these guys already have Los Angeles footprinter operations anyhow. Yep. So it's not so the point is it's it's not the logistics side of that is not uh, hard to sell. Where you need a little bit of thought, it's not the it's not just the movement of goods, where you need a little bit of thought because you're launching a new brand and new market is a little bit of inventory management that's got a, a more flexibility than the US. In the US we try to ring out all excess inventory, all surplus, everything's GIT because it's a cost, it's ROE, we know, we know this. And what we tell you, that, that's all true in China as well. But for the first 6, 12, 18 months, you want to overshoot a little bit because you want to take advantage of good news. So you don't know, are we selling $10,000 a month of product or are we selling $100,000 a month of product? And you won't know that for several months. And you're building during those several months as well. So the point is you've got to have some capacity in the early months for some element of surplus inventory over time as patterns become more regularized and more predictable, then you can, the, the lines will converge and you say, we don't need surplus at this point because we sort of know what's going on. Uh, we have to dial up for some of the promotions like singles day, but we know we're at a steady state growth of, you know, $50,000 a product a month, uh, but it's growing 
it's growing 20% a year. So we're, you know, going to go on that trajectory. So, but that, but that, but there's a reasonable, reasonably straightforward solution to that whole logistics inventory operations side of things. Yeah. And and folks are used to ramping things up here in preparation for back to school or holidays. So that's, you know, that's not, well, you're right. It's very much, it's very much like that. It's very much like that, that, that you have to, you know, there's a calendar and you've got to play into the calendar and the T-Mall to give you a little peek behind the curtain, the T-Mall people quite reasonably to my mind will say to us, look, you're going to participate in our promotions to a level consistent with your inventory on hand. Mm-hmm. Because if you're only stocking $50,000 in inventory, we're not going to put you on sort of the front page of the, of the, of the e-commerce uh, website. We're not, but, but if you've got a million dollars of inventory, we can go deeper with you and do more things with you because you're going to you know, be able to move a million dollars of products. So, so everybody has their own formula there, but you want to tear it up commensurate with your possibilities. Gotcha. All right. So take off your businessman hat, put on your political hat. Um, we're in the middle of a trade conflict, trade war, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's been recent news of the Chinese government going after defense companies that sell arms to Taiwan. And so, you know, I, I think we're far off from getting hit as a footwear, American footwear brand in China. But do you have any of those concerns or, or is there a reason not to be bullish well, on having an e-commerce strategy? Yeah, I, I, I think a little. There's a little concern here, but it's generally it, it's it's what we'd say is we're generally bullish with a little bit of caution. And the bull, I'll tell you, I'll explain both points. The, the bullishness, the optimism is: look, the economy is performing, and retail sales. This is an emerging market; they're hitting middle income status, but still climbing out of poverty. So, but we know in that kind of situation that retail sales outperform the economy. So, the economy this year is going to grow something like uh, 6%. They said 6.2% last quarter. And retail sales will grow something like 15% because people are just now getting into, you know, decent jobs for the first time in their life. So you're out spend a bit. You're buying that big screen TV or the first time you bought a bottle of wine or, you know, the first time in your life you've owned more than one pair of shoes. So it's, you know, you're, you've reached a point where you can do that. And the other interesting point is e-commerce is outpacing retail sales. So you're picking the fastest growing channel of the fastest growing segment of still a nicely growing economy. So that's our basis of bullishness. We, e-commerce sales this year in China will be up something like 27 percent, right? Wow. And this is on this is on a base that's the largest in the world. China e-commerce sales are three times U.S. e-commerce sales. Wow. So, so you're, you're hitting 27 percent. So that's the bullishness. That's so the fundamental market fundamentals are really good in that market. The caution, we might say 80% optimistic, 20% caution. The caution comes from what you just articulated. The economy is off peak. So even at 6%, it's down a little from 7%. So it's off peak. Uh, and and there is no question there's trade friction out there. And, and there can be contagion, which which has not happened to date. But you don't know. Things could yeah. deteriorate. It, yeah. So what we would tell people on that caution side is – keep a very light footprint in China. Any market where there might be volatility, be careful about debt, be careful about fixed costs. You yeah. know, before I went into e-commerce, I worked in banking. I was at Citibank. I was at Bank of America doing a lot of China work. And this was our general advice to companies that the companies who get in trouble in China are the companies that basically just replicate a U.S. model in China and say, China is just a big America and if I'm doing these 20 things in the U.S., I'm going to do all 20 things in China. To say, you know, you don't have to do that. That's what you're used to. But but watch out for building out physical structures in China if there might be volatility. You might you might put $100 million into warehouses in the U.S. Maybe you don't want to do that in China. Maybe you want to rent, even though you're leaving some money on the table. You might have your own truck fleet in the U.S. Maybe I don't – I'd say don't be – be thoughtful about doing that in China. Maybe you just want to hold off on that for now, even though, again, it's going to be more costly maybe to go through a third party to do that. But the point is you've got a very light footprint, so you don't have fixed costs. So if the market takes a hit and the market's off 30%, you say, look, we're still going to make money. We'll make 30% less money, but we're still okay, even if there's a real shock to the market. But if you've got those fixed costs, watch out, because now you're saying we're bleeding to death, man. We built this new warehouse and – Markets off thirty percent. So, so we just say as a friendly advice to everybody is have a resilient model that can take a shock. And this is how we kind of backed into e-commerce. 
because you say e-commerce is all just calibrated to sales. It's a very cash, a very fast cash cycle. There's no real capex. You dial up or dial down your marketing, advertising, commensal with your with your revenue anyhow. So if there's a shock, fine, it all gets dialed down a bit. And if we're in boom times, it all gets dialed up a bit. But I'm not, I'm not fussed. I won't lose any sleep, even if there's a, a pretty severe shock. I'll still sell into that market. I'll still do okay. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, Frank, this conversation has been awesome. Um, where can folks find you? What's your URL? How do you? How can folks? Yeah, get- please. We love. I'm, I'm I'm on LinkedIn at Frank uh, Lavin. Uh, so I'd love to connect with people on LinkedIn. And please take a look at our website, which is one word export now so www.exportnow.com and take a look we love talking to u.s brands we love meeting folks we love working with great u.s companies and helping them get going in china so we'd be delighted to talk to any of the folks uh, listening in and chat with them about could we make this thing work in china that's awesome and the last thing i'll say is i know you speak mandarin so give this to me if you can hey check out the new nikes i just bought can you say that? hey 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 Neiman Dung guy. Come out, woman, uh, side my the Nike. So that's a hey, everybody. Hey, my friends, you guys all just have to take a look at the, what I um, the Nikes I just bought. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Frank. Thank you so much. So for that me. was a great conversation, with Frank. He knows Mandarin, he's known for a long time. And as, as we talked about, Chinese love American brands, they, they love do. global brands. They want to show, they want on social media to show people the new Nikes they just bought. So he, he just laid it on us on how to do that in Mandarin. I love it. Frank is, Frank's fun. Yep. But Frank is a deep thinker, and I think, you know, working with him would make brands a lot better. Um, one of the presentations he gave for us in this last year was how brands need to understand that you can't come up with one size fits all marketing strategy, sales strategies. Yeah. You have to think about cultural implications yep. and a number of other factors. And uh, he's helping folks do that uh, specifically in China. But uh, I think just. Every time I talk to Frank, I learn something new. Things I may not want to know. But. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's well said. Well, folks, we are so grateful that you listen into our conversation uh, with Frank Labin today. And we're grateful that you continue to download and listen to Shoe and Show. Please rate us. Give us five-star ratings. Five-star, five-star. Five, five-star only. And um, follow us on a variety of different platforms. But more importantly, go to shoeandshow.com for all your Shoe and Show needs. On behalf of Andy and Mr. Frank Labin. Shoe In Show is out. Out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.